Hi there, welcome back to LOCAD TV. Today, I'm delighted to say that we're joined by Olivier Ezrati, who has over 30 years experience in the technology industry, including 15 years at Microsoft. He's also the author of The Guide of Startups, which is now entering its 22nd edition here in France. So Olivier, thanks for joining us here on LOCAD Hi. TV today. And yeah. um, perhaps a nice place to start would be with just a bit of an introduction to yourself. So how did you first get interested in startups? Uh, well, um, it started about 30, 30 years, 13 years ago. But uh, I would say first, I'm a software engineer. Because, because doing marketing, um, b before doing marketing at Microsoft, I was a software engineer for about four or five years. And then when, uh, after being a CMO, after managing developer relationships, after starting the startup, uh, relationship ecosystem within Microsoft. I, I thought it was interesting to kind of bring back some some skills to startups in the French scene. So I, I, I started to be a business angel uh, in 2005 and six. I helped a couple of small companies. It helped me kind of understand the world of VCs, uh, how money was flowing out, uh, what were the key success factors of startup. And my my goal was to learn and share. That's why I wrote this guide. Uh, which I update uh, continuously since uh, that time. Okay, nice. And as always on LOCAD TV, we're joined by Johannes Vermeerel, who I reckon might know a thing or two about startups. Um, so our topic today is myth <coughs> versus reality in startups. Um, so what are these myths that we're kind of seeing in startups? What do you mean by that? Okay, um, so as a, as a startup entrepreneur myself, you see, I can see that um, you're uh, you're always facing a, a difficult situation. Your product is never ready enough. You never have enough time, enough funds. So, so there is always a stretch and you have the urgency of actually push something to the market. So that puts you in a situation where the incentives are, I would say, very strong on, I would say, you stretching the truth toward uh, something that is a bit more than what you can actually deliver. And uh, maybe in the, in the case of the B2B software, it's even, the situation is even worse because the sales cycle are very long. So you can actually stretch the truth, but if it takes one year to close the deal, with one year more, you might have actually had the time to deliver finally what you promised one year ago by just because the sales cycle was very long. So uh, again, I'm not saying that it was a path chosen by LOCAD. We, we try to stick very close to what we were doing. And if you look at the blog, uh, um, the, the long history of the blog post of LOCAD, I also discuss extensively all the paths that we tried and failed and, and these sort of things. But nonetheless, I, I find that it's, it's very interesting and to have like Olivier, uh, who is probably, as far as I'm concerned, probably one of the greatest experts in France alive on, or I would say, on the startups ecosystems at large. It's, uh, it w I would be interested to Olivier to have your, your opinion on maybe those, those various areas that gets those buzzwords that receive tons of attentions where you can see maybe a lot of startups who are trying to claim their own uh, uh, magic pills or you know, mm -hmm. their, their own disruption factor and how do they cope with all those constraints and sticking to something that is still, I would say, mostly true. No. So is this something you agree with, Olivier? Yeah, uh, startups claiming they can do more than they can actually possibly do in a minute? Yes, they do. They need to do it, actually, because a startup is a, is a kind of dream company. They dream about the future. They dream about cre creating stuff that doesn't exist necessarily. Uh, we know that there's a very high failure rate. So uh, I would say that somebody, somebody who creates a startup which, which is not kind of pushing the envelope far enough is not uh, a real entrepreneur. The, the, the real innovators are those who are changing the marketplace. Changing is complicated. It takes, you need to take risk, you need to test various options uh, simultaneously. And you know, one of the reasons why, for, for example, large companies are working with startups is they are kind of externalizing the risk. So the myth is uh, it's really going to help the large companies to innovate. But the, the, the real reason is th they can't innovate internally because it's too heavy, too complicated. So they just ask other people to take the risk. and. Uh, and get the, the burden out, out of it. Okay. And are there any sort of like other incentives, maybe Johannes, are there other incentives that means startups are sort of lying? Um, are there any other reasons for this? <laughs> lying is the extreme. <laughs> lying. Yes. And the, w one of the points that I see is, um, uh, especially I would say in, in B2C software that requires, um, especially when you're dealing with complex systems like supply chain, is that to roll out your, your, your innovation, it will take 
several years of efforts. Mm. And, um, and so what I see is that if you push the envelope a bit too far, not in the sense of, of claim, mm. well, you end up with a slightly dysfunctional relationship mm. between the, the, the startup and uh, the company who is trying to roll out the technology. And it tend to, uh, to fail for the wrong reason, such as it, it failed because uh, the trust is destroyed before they had the time to, um, or they, they had the chance to, took, to take the time to polish all the flows mm. to, to make it work out. And uh, it's, very, it's very interesting because I've seen that, in, especially in supply chain, where by design you're talking of many countries, many systems, you have mm. to interconnect <coughs> them. So it's, it's like uh, complications on steroids, uh, as I would say, as far um, uh, B2B enterprise software is concerned. And, uh, and I have seen many situations where companies, large companies jump from one potential startup to the next like every two years, but they mm. always fail, mm. you know, two years short of, of being able to roll out the thing. But, uh, and, and then uh, it also can create some kind of maybe not AI winter, mm. but, but some situations where you have um, a company have tried and declared something as a failure like premature leave just because it was taking more time. And again, mm, uh, yeah. so, but, but again, I, I don't, uh, we were, you know, we were on the, on both sides of this equation. You have to, you have to dream and to imagine a lot of stuff. I mean, for example, one of the things that we dreamed very early on at LOCAD was the idea of um, having demand forecasts that could leverage from uh, the fact that you have access to, the, to many, many data sets coming from many industries. So the idea is that you can probably tune your, forecasting model mm. better in the end it has nothing nowadays what we we have finally managed to do it but it was like eight years after the initial thought it's completely unlike the initial idea that was oh we are going to capture the early trend from fashion that will explain c the consumption of consumer electronics and whatnot these sort of things that do not work the um, w we can leverage data coming from different verticals to improve the qu forecast accuracy but it's mostly a matter of um, having access to more data so that when you do your deep learning uh, um, uh, gradient descent, <coughs> you have more data to regress and it's more stable so can, you can use more parameters and in the end it works better. Even if you, you do not have any specific kind of domain transfer you, where you would mm -hmm. like prior information from fashion that flows to uh, consumer electrics and whatnot. It's just a matter of more data sets so that you can train a, a bigger computational network. Yeah, so the, the, the global myth, I would say, on entrepreneurship is uh, the kind of myth of easiness. Easy to get money and funding, easy to get a customer, easy to uh, deliver a product on time. This is kind of misconceptions of myth. And uh, m most of the time, it's, uh, it's linked to the lack of experience. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. when somebody is just young, out of school, and creating a startup, he has no background. Okay. So he's dreaming, and he's trying to do uh, the, his best. He's trying to hire the, the best people. Uh, so let's can. talk about that yeah. funding. Where yeah. does that funding come from? Who's actually funding these startups? Oh, <laughs> everywhere. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you have uh, business in Jaws. You have public funding in France, uh, in some parts of Europe. Uh, you can have uh, so-called VCs. Uh, sometimes you have ICOs where you don't know the money, where the money comes from. Yeah. Usually it comes from Bitcoin, uh, added value from some, pe some people who are invested in Bitcoins and those guys invest in blockchain companies. So there's a new kid in town uh, in funding. It's, uh, you have corporate venture now. <laughs> it didn't exist 10 years ago. Uh, I've seen a, a sharp increase in the last three years of corporate venture. Take a company like Sigfox, for example, who raised more than 300 uh, million dollars or euros. Uh, part of that comes from Samsung, Total, um, whoever. Uh, so th th it's, a, it's a big change. And Johannes, we're sort of talking about pushing the envelope. <coughs> and uh, are there any examples in the real world of companies that have pushed the envelope a little bit too much? And they've kind of taken on too much funding, tried to mm. uh, produce some technology and it's not quite worked I, out? I believe Olivier is much more an expert than me on that <laughs> one. But there is some very notable mm. uh, example. Terranos, for example, sure. they, mm. they went way too far with way too, mu too much money. but. And indeed, I think in the end they took something like eight hundred million dollars. More, of two More. billion. Two billion. Okay, so it's, it, it was. It's even, even worse. Yeah. <laughs> this story is crazy because uh, uh, most people know about this. It was a healthcare company, a med tech company, and the the the, the, the woman who created that, Elizabeth Holt, uh, was dreaming about some product, but she had no idea on how to do it. Some kind of blood testing. Uh, 
cheap blood testing thing. And uh, so she got money from um, investors who didn't have a clue about this market, uh, politicians from the US, I mean, Helen Kissinger, or James Mathis, or guys like that. And then she got the funding. She hired a British CTO yeah. uh, who, who couldn't do the, the engine. And in the end, it became a scam. And, uh, but what's funny is there was a French journalist, actually, it's a son of a famous French journalist, uh, uh, Carreroux. He wrote a paper in the Wall Street Journal in the US two or three years ago, and he did um, explain the scam. But the company was able to double its funding after the paper was published. So they went to about $762 million to $2 billion after the scandal started. That's a shame. Yeah. You have another one, less famous, Magic Leap. Yes, Magic yes. Leap, $2 billion for uh, um, augmented reality uh, headset. Not sure it, well, it's worth. Uh, that funding. So why are people so happy to fund these people? Why are oh, they the giving investors? this money? Why are the investors you know, there's yeah, so happy there's a very, si very simple reason. Uh, it's, so, it's called the fear of missing out. So, so the, uh, large investors, particularly in the US, they want to be sure that they're, they're going to invest on the next Facebook or the next, maybe not Twitter, but the, <laughs> the next uh, successful worldwide company uh, getting, uh, becoming a leader on a new market. So when they spot a company who could uh, disrupt uh, one sector, so healthcare, transportation, whatever, uh, and they kind of think this one is going to be the one. They, they, they put a lot of money in that company. They want to send and convey a message to other investors that there's, there's no need to invest anywhere else. It's kind of war. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an art of war. Uh, it, it's kind of, uh, um, uh, it's a signal they send to others. Sometimes it fails because we, we, we mentioned two examples where it's not necessarily a success, but Facebook was a bit like that. Facebook, before the IPO, I think they raised about one and a half billion with Russian money and like Trump. And so, uh, they, they got money from everywhere, China, Russia, uh, Europe, uh, the US, uh, because people thought, and they were right, that it would be a success. Then they did the IPO, uh, 2013 or 12, yeah, yeah. I don't remember exactly. And it's still successful, and the company now makes more than 60 billion. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Okay. And Johannes, is there any way of improving like the clarity? So say I'm an investor, I want to know what I'm investing in. How can it become more clear for me? I mean, that's, that brings back to maybe what the blog of Olivier that, I, that I've been reading for a decade, where Olivier is doing like an extensive survey of, I would say, the, the, base, the buzzwords. I think you've, you've, you've surveyed AI blockchain, quantum computing, I forgot. Genomics, Gen genomics, genomics, astronomy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and I'm still, I mean, for me, I think that the, and I've done, uh, you know, uh, although I'm, I'm running low CAD uh, uh, as a side business, um, uh, I sometimes get uh, due diligence technical, mm. I would say missions funded by uh, venture capitalist <coughs> funds who basically ask me to do like a, a, a technological audit. Of, of some software companies, that's my area of expertise. But I'm, I'm still, um, I'm still a bit puzzled by the fact that indeed there is still um, a level of amateurism uh, mm. in terms of amount mm. of due diligence that mm. is, uh, in my eyes, completely mismatching the sheer amount of money that is purchased in this one. It still work out because it, those, the small odds of success are sufficient mm. so that it, it pay back. But mm. maybe you, Olivier, who are on the front end of evangelism, of, mm. of, of I would say, evangelizing the market to more rationality and, and mm. also to, um, to decide that it's not because it advanced like magic leap or it looks like magic mm. that you cannot figure out mm. what is uh, the physics behind it or, you know, uh, uh, what, what is your perception on, on educating the market at large on um, and I would say well, embracing <laughs> these topics rather than say yeah. we are going to trust the experts. It's tough because we, we have so many different topics popping up every year. I mean, uh, blockchain is quite new. Uh, y you have more and more complicated topics, so you have uh, you need more expertise, more time to get through the understanding of uh, all these new techniques. AI is part of it. AI, there's a number of stupid things that are said about AI. People who think that deep learning is doing everything where it does only 25% of what you can do with AI. Uh, you have a lot of stupidity around because people are not knowledgeable. And one of the reasons is uh, the world of entrepreneurship, uh, I'm not sure about variations between countries, but at least in France, the world of entrepreneurship is, is a mix of engineers and science 
people, but a lot of non-scientific people, and they don't know, they don't have any clue about all of this. And there's a lack, I think, of science understanding for many different uh, of these topics. So I, I know a lot of companies were created based on AI mm -hmm. by people who don't know anything about AI. And they thought that they could do something, so they say, okay, we've got an idea, we're going to do a chatbot for whatever thing they want, and then they hire some people, but they don't know if it's possible to do it. Like Elis Elizabeth Holmes, she was from Stanford, she had only one year uh, of graduation on, on uh, healthcare, and then she said, we're going to do a blood testing thing. She had no idea. So it's, it's kind of crazy. People who create things, they, 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 they don't have enough science background. So my, mm, the thing I'm trying to evangelize uh, in the market is elevate your understanding of science. You need to, to do that for two reasons. One, if you're an investor, to be able to do the due diligence process of those companies. And second, you're going to understand what's happening. You're going to be able to uh, have a clue of what you couldn't do uh, in innovation. And then I think it's going to be a very useful tool to be uh, differentiated, to create worldwide companies where if you think that if you are doing just an intermediation site on whatever uh, business there is, uh, it's very difficult to scale worldwide because the American community is going to have more money than you and uh, you, won't, you can't create uh, easily a Facebook based in France, started, starting in France. You, you can create that if you have some technology that you can, can sell elsewhere, but there's some magic inside the technology that nobody knows about elsewhere. I mean, what I'm really getting here <coughs> is, is it's not really in a company's interest, is it? I mean, for a company, they're making money, they're being invested in, and it's not really in their interest to improve this kind of understanding in the marketplace. So it's obviously in the interest for a of startup, the investors. For a startup, for a startup yeah. Uh, it, depend, it depends. So why is it in their interest? Yeah. Oh, to improve the understanding? Yeah. Well, uh, my, my response was about the market itself. I mean, for investors, for... For the uh, investors, it makes sense. Yeah, but for the companies uh, itself? It, well, it, it depends where you are in your product life cycle. If you, are, uh, if you are creating a new product category and you need to educate the market, maybe you need to explain a little bit the, 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 the inners of your products and your technology. If you are a leader, if you don't have a lot of, of competition, you can protect some of your IP with a so-called industrial uh, secret. So you, you, yeah, you don't explain how it works. It's a magic trick. Okay, you can do that. But if you have a lot of competition, if you, um, if you are not, um, if you have some differentiation that it, you need to explain it, you need to explain uh, where, where is this, the, the stuff in your product. And that, that's very interesting <coughs> because it seems that, for example, on AI, uh, many large companies went through those stages. I mean, first mm. they were, publishing a few research paper, Google did that a lot mm. at the very beginning, to get traction, hire more people. Yep. Then they yep. went very strong on their secret sauce, and then past mm. maturity stage, they are now back up uh, again, publishing. opening, publishing, publishing a lot, yeah. because uh, they have so many competitors that they just want to literally uh, win the, um, the, 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 the mind share battle. Hearts and minds, like they say. Hearts yeah. and minds, mm. so that people are thinking of TensorFlow, building mm. around that and using the tensor processing unit and everything. Yeah. There's, a, there's a big misconception about AI uh, for this respect. Uh, most of the, the science behind AI is public. Yeah. It's public domain. You can yeah. find anything on research papers. You go on Arxiv, you got everything. Yeah. I, I, I think probably only two or three percent is missing, not yeah, more. Yeah. Everything is there, but then you need the skills. You need to understand the tools, and then you need to apply it for uh, a solution. And the, the, the knowledge on AI is, uh, I if you create a startup, is about how do you assemble all of this. The second misconception is AI is a product. It's not true. AI is not a product. AI is a toolbox with a lot of tools. It's like Lego with uh, all these different pieces, and uh, you say, I create a dinosaur. Ah, <laughs> it's going to be hard. So create a space shuttle, but a five meter one. So it's going to be complicated. So uh, the, the skills with AI is how do you assemble all those bricks, like machine learning, deep learning, whatever, NLP, uh, natural language processing. And that's, that's, uh, that requires a lot of knowledge. And uh, the integration requires a lot of knowledge. And people uh, think that it's magic. Integration is, uh, it's got a lot of value. Then you need to source your data. Uh, you need to update it, you need to check the quality of the data, that's, that's a lot of knowledge. And then you need to know, know the business yeah. of your customers. Okay. Okay. Exactly, and mm. in the specific case of supply <coughs> chain, there is one extra twist, is also mm. that um, you need to uh, 
define what you optimize, you know, because mm -hmm. you're building, you know, you have your data pipeline, you're extracting data from your ERP um, or your, your company systems, and ultimately you want to do that to deliver some kind of optimization, but you don't want to optimize to optimize percentages, you want mm -hmm. to optimize euros, mm -hmm. and suddenly it's, um, you have to write down the formula of what you're optimizing, and, and for most of our clients, it's the first time in their history that they have to have like an explicit financial optimization and the problem is that you can mm. y you have plenty of ways of doing it wrong by doing <coughs> by being very short-sighted mm. so you need to to think of formula that tr reflect your true strategic mix and not just like super dumb um, uh, short-term-ish objectives so for example if you mm. want to optimize the price in the store um, a, a, a naive statistical analysis would tell you any store in Paris you can raise the price by 20% and your margin will just skyrocket for a couple of weeks and then people will just go somewhere mm, else because mm. they will learn that you're mm. way too expensive. So and let's talk about that supply chain industry. What sort of myths are you seeing in the marketplace that other companies are putting out there? Um, so one myth I think it's, uh, it's, it's very funny. It's, uh, specifically for, for Locad is um, that there is something extremely specific about the human mind when it comes to uh, see the future and forecast the future from the supply chain angle. So I'm just saying that for Olivier, mm. uh, which is really, imagine you have a company, 100,000 SKUs. Uh, most of those products are just sold intermittently. It's very erratic, super noisy. And, and here, it's very funny because even you know we are couple of decades now down the path of having statistical methods to do that, but we still have a lot of people that I would qualify as non-believer of statistics. I'm not even talking of AI, mm -hmm. but just mm -hmm. statistics. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a challenge. And the reality is, again, back to, to that there were a lot of startups who did pretty bad statistics, which is even worse than a human mm -hmm. who is just approximately correct when you do bad statistics, you're just exactly wrong, which is kind of even worse. Um, and um, also there was a lot of, uh, I think we, we had several series of waves of, of innovation that, that proved to be kind of tons of complication on themselves. Uh, big data, a lot, of, a lot of companies in supply chain, they have a lot of data to, to process, so they, they went into big data systems, but not necessarily with very clear goals mm -hmm. on what they want to do with that. So they, they did end up, we have some clients, mm -hmm. so they did end up having a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, um, Adoop clusters mm. used for, I mean, fuzzy purposes. But I think it's, it, it's again back to what you're saying. AI is not a product, it's part of the toolbox. Big data was kind of the same. Mm. Exactly, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, what, what I see more generally, not specifically in the, the supply chain sector, is there's a kind of bias called the rear mirror effect. Uh, when you use your data, you, it's data from the past, and most companies want to predict the future with data from the past. Mm -hmm. And that's sometimes, what uh, <laughs> hmm? what? that's what we do. That's, what, like, that's what you do. But yeah. uh, there's a danger with that because yes. Uh, yes. if you drive and you look only at the rear mirror, you don't see the tree. <laughs> yes. so, and then you get the tree. <laughs> yes. and say, oh, I got the tree. So what happened? So, so let's say the. Uh, you, if you take France, you're Canal Plus, uh, maybe they do some surveys on their data, but they have Netflix. And when Netflix was released, I remember 2014, it was uh, so four years ago, they said, oh, it's going to be a picnic, it's going to be easy to beat them. So now uh, they're gone, they stopped uh, doing uh, VOD and uh, Netflix uh, got the market. Yeah. So it's interesting to see that uh, if you don't have a real good product marketing uh, in your company and you just believe on data and you don't look at the competition, you don't look at how people change their minds and change their behavior, uh, how the day in the life of, of a consumer is uh, changing uh, with the uh, new technologies and new services, you miss the whole thing and the data won't tell you. So how would yeah. you assess a company such as Locad? Oh, a startup you mean? How would you assess that startup and how would you assess... Uh, oh, generally speaking? Yeah, and uh, especially as a company such as Locad in a supply chain uh, perspective. How well would you generally, assess Generally there's does? no magic trick. Uh, uh, I look at everything. So first is the team. So who are the people? Where are they coming from? Are they uh, good people? I say, uh, can you talk with them? Or are they listening? Uh, the listening skills of an entrepreneur is very important. Uh, I, I saw a presentation a while ago, which was very interesting. He says, we, we said that in a sales call, you see uh, a, a good person if he's listening more than talking. By the way, I talk too much. <laughs> but 
but I'm not a salesperson. So uh, I'm more an evangelist, so I can have some excuse. But it's very important to be able to understand, to listen. And also, the, one of the things for an entrepreneur is how he's managing his schizophrenia. <laughs> because an entrepreneur is a schizophrenia guy. Because he has to be a dreamer, he has to think big and uh, to change the market and so on. But still, he has to have uh, his foot on the ground, he has to understand his uh, PL, he has to uh, hire people, he has to manage them, he has to reward them. So these are very traditional management things. So the schizophrenia is uh, long term, short term, uh, uh, visionary and uh, hands on. Uh, he, it's it's hard. It's hard. I think it's a, it's one of the hardest things to do as an entrepreneur. And you see that if you talk to an entrepreneur, you can see that in his psychology. You see that when you talk with him. You, you see if he's able to move back and forth on these two dimensions. So uh, this is one of the things. The second is uh, the ID. Basically, the ID. Uh, there are so shitty IDs. Uh, <laughs> so many shitty IDs in the startup scene. Uh, you go in Station F, uh, 1,000 companies. Uh, w I dare say, 80% is shitty. The uh, station F is 200 meters yeah, away from just, yeah. <laughs> just next door. So you have so many shitty ideas, uh, even with good teams. So some entrepreneurs say, uh, some investors, they say, okay, it's shitty idea, but the team is good, so let's go. I say, no, fuck, hmm? don't do that. Uh, <laughs> get a good idea and uh, keep the good team. So uh, it's very important to, to have a good idea. What is a good idea? A good idea is, uh, is uh, solving a problem that exists for a significant number of people with uh, some scalability, some differentiation, understanding where the pain comes from uh, with your custom potential customers. Is the pain coming from the absence of solution? Is the pain coming from existing solutions? Uh, is the pain coming from integration, cost, timing, whatever? And uh, m the good entrepreneurs, they have a very depth knowledge of all of these things, the problems. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I read a lot of books, I talked to many uh, successful entrepreneurs in, in the past, and what they said is uh, those guys who spent more time digging into the, the, the pain point they were trying to solve than just designing a solution uh, from the scratch, they were more successful. Great. Yeah, that's, it's, it's a good insight. I loved it. I didn't invent it. I, I, I learned it. So that's some great advice. Really good, insight, really yeah. good advice yeah. there. So maybe as sort of a last question, Johannes, as someone who's been there, done it, <laughs> what advice would you give to someone who's starting out with a startup? Uh, I don't know if I can really give advice. I mean, Locat has been moderately successful, but we're not Google yet. Um, but I mean, my, my specific taste was for ancient problems, you know, where I started yeah. low-cad with, um, with supply chain. Unsolved problems, you mean? Yeah. Mm. Yes, mm. unsolved, but also very, very fundamental and very basic problem. Mm. I mean, uh, just deciding how much to produce, where to produce, where to pile up your inventory is something very basic. I mean, it's uh, even if we are uh, uh, transitioning toward, um, I would say, a relatively digital economy where uh, digital assets have uh, a lot of importance, People still need to eat, so basically there is like physical stuff that needs to be moved around. Um, if it's perishable, if you stock too much, you will, it, you, you will have expiration dates issues, so you will have to discard your inventory. Uh, and, and because of the world has gone global, uh, that was very funny. The, the downside of that is that the supply chains have become maddeningly complex. I mean, if you decide to produce every single consumer electronic devices produced in like 20 different countries and assemble extra, there is a lot of inefficiencies. But so my taste was identify problems that were um, relatively fundamental that do not change that much because probably mm -hmm. the, the physics, uh, 3D printing is great, but it's still not there yet. I mean, you, I think you had a series also on, mm. on that. <laughs> Every year uh, during the CS but, report, uh, yeah. and And it's progressing, but I think we will still not 3D print on our cars. For, uh, well, it's working on B2B uh, in industry, but not working very well in the consumer space. Yeah, that's the status today. As soon as you want mass production, yeah. it's still still not very competitive. So the, the bottom line, I try to identify relatively fundamental problems uh, that would not change so much. So maybe the solution to the problem would change because you have some waves of new AI theories that would mm. challenge how you can tackle the problem. But I was thinking of let's first identify a problem that itself is relatively stable so that if you mm. rinse and repeat your efforts you have a chance of not the i would say of having a problem that would just not elude your grasp just because the problem has become a non-problem because it has 
kind of completely disappeared. Mm. Uh, that would be, for example, the opposite of, of my approach would be there were uh, at some point a lot of companies who were trying to do a Twitter app. Mm. Uh, and that was for me pretty much the, the kind of the absolute opposite of what I was trying to, uh, mm. to solve. But again, that's a, that's a matter of taste. So, but but I, it feels to me that it's still a lot of, I would say, very crude problem, uncool problem mm. are still relatively undervalued in the startup world where people um, try a lot of things on lifestyle. I mean, if I compare the number of startups that are trying to do like a, a lifestyle thingy compared to, let's say, uh, improving our garbage collection cycle or you know how c mm -hmm. you can recycle more, how you can dispose more. Uh, you see something like that. You mm -hmm. know the extreme um, cool that would be like uh, waste processing versus lifestyle. I'm pretty sure that it's like uh, 100 startup to one. And yet mm -hmm. for the wo uh, the world economy at large, disposing of the waste in a way that is safe, that does not create mm -hmm. health health issues and whatnot, and that is environmentally friendly. It's a huge thing. But again, that's, that's my you know, own perspective. In, in your space, uh, the so-called B2B uh, enterprise companies, the, 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 toughest, the toughest thing to do is to create a product. It's a skill that's not so broadly uh, taught and known. Uh, it's complicated to create a product. Uh, so what happens with a lot of startups, uh, at least here in France, is many startups think they create a product, but in the end they do a service. So they have consultants and they do the pro uh, they work on the project base for each and, and every customer. So the, 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 big, the, the big challenge and the discipline to, to understand and to create is a discipline that's mixing an understanding of your customer, an, uh, an understanding of marketing and business, how do you scale and how do you make some efficiencies, and an understanding of the, the way you use the technology to create a product. And mixing those three things is uh, very rare. There are very few companies who do that well. And some of the reason is it's hard to fund it because you need to have so significant funding to pay for creating a product where you don't get revenue for a while and then maybe after one or two years or even more sometimes, you, like Magic Leap, you get some revenue. And if you don't have enough revenue, what you do is you do sell a kind of unfinished product where you need more service to sell it to your first customers, but then you become a service company. So there's a kind of connection between the, the way you can uh, raise enough money, maybe outside of your own country, if you want to scale, uh, let's get money from the US, for example, and the way you create a product. So that this is a very important skill, and I'm kind of advocating for learning that skill. Sounds well, fairly uh, similar to what we do here at yeah, Lake yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cool, so I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up for <coughs> today, but uh, thanks very much for taking the time out to talk to us today. Thank you. Okay, so that's all for this week's episode. We'll be back again next week. Until then, bye for now.